Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be talking about the goings on in week 11 of the Ramish Sunni Bawani case. Now although this case seems to be dragging on, I did a quick comparison between the Holmes trial and this trial to see where the prosecution are in their arguments. So we're in week 11 now, that's week starting Monday the 11th of May 2022. And in the Holmes trial, things wrapped up for the prosecution at the end of week 12. Now in this trial we had two weeks effectively on jury selection before things really got going so on that basis um, by my rough reckoning we're about a week behind the Holmes case. Anyway I didn't check the total days in court but by my rough reckoning we're about the same. It does seem to be dragging on though despite all that. The first day this week was a bit of a washout as there was an ill juror and so witness testimony was suspended and the jury stayed at home. You might be wondering why they didn't swear in an alternate juror, and so am I. Perhaps the juror has some kind of temporary ailment, which means they'll be back in a day or so. Which they were. The court turned to drier matters in the meantime, arguing about the admissibility of evidence relating to a patient's HIV test. Yep, you guessed it, Theranos gave her a positive test, when in reality she was negative. The arguments were about the level of technical detail and reports that could be put in front of the jury without expert witnesses. We had another investor witness. This time it was Brian Grossman who worked for PFM Health Sciences. Bawani was actually his contact at Theranos during the lead up to their investment in the company. And what was that investment? $96 million as per the indictment. So he testified that Balwani tightly controlled access to the company and information about it which actually hampered his ability to do due diligence. For example, Bawani rejected his request to speak to Theranos business partners, like Walgreens I guess, and only one person from their firm could visit Theranos lab. He was impressed with Balwani and Holmes when he met them in December 2013. He was impressed with their description of their tech. He was impressed with the number of blood tests that could be run on a single finger prick. They told him about their 10-year stealth mode up until that point. They told him that they were working with the military. They told him how their tech saved lives on the battlefield. He was impressed with their Walgreens partnership and contract. He was impressed with the whole miniaturisation of the tech and implications for cost reductions. This was a radical change for how this industry operated, he said. We had one of those key questions from the prosecution. At any point did Miss Holmes or Mr. Balwani say that the Theranos analyzer was currently being used for just a handful of tests? No, he replied. Would that information have been relevant? It would have been extremely relevant, Grossman replied. After their initial meetings, Grossman had asked Balwani if PFM could speak to someone at Walgreens and United Healthcare to learn more about their business partnerships. Balwani told him that he was uncomfortable with the idea, saying that it would make Theranos look bad. He basically shut it down, Grossman said. Well, what do you think happened when Grossman and a few of his colleagues at PFM visited Walgreens to get a Theranos blood test? Yep, you guessed it. No fingerprint test, just a big bad needle. Bawani told him when he was asked about it that he had ordered a very, very weird test that couldn't be done with a finger stick test. We then had one of those own goal moments when Grossman was asked to relay details about the press conference Holmes did in October 2015. Now remember this was after the Wall Street Journal article came out stating that the company was having trouble with its technology and wasn't using it for all its tests. Grossman had noted that Holmes had said in that conference, in quotes, Theranos had never used commercially based lab equipment for testing blood samples. There was a text message from Bawani to Holmes on that day when he said, in quotes, worried about your all finger stick tests on our technology comment. You bet he was. Anyway, that puts Bawani right on the button of knowing for a fact what Theranos in other words, Balwani and Holmes, was saying about the testing done on its own technology was false. Back of the net for the prosecution, I think. Just to add a, another soccer-based metaphor in for good luck. Well, we really got motoring in the back half of the week when we had patient-related evidence put in front of court. Now, these related to false tests provided by Theranos. The first was in respect of an AIDS test, that was discussed in the pre-jury discussion. 
This patient was Erin Tompkins and quite simply she had had a result from Theranos indicating she had HIV antibodies, in other words a precursor to AIDS. On a second test it came up negative. Erin testified at the Holmes trial too and spoke outside court after the Bawani appearance and made the point that she thought that the main focus had been on the financial investors who got defrauded and the patient witnesses were treated as peripheral. As she put it, We were defrauded because we trusted them with our blood and however many dollars for the test. But we weren't robbed of millions of dollars, she said. In my opinion, it's true that the patient testimony is getting less emphasis, although with Balwani, I think the prosecution have made a closer link between his activities and knowledge about tests in relation to running a defective lab than they did with Holmes in her case. Anyway, we'll see what the jury make of it in due course. A similar tale came from Mark Burns in relation to a patient of his who had had a test suggesting he had prostate cancer. Following up with a test from another company, he got negative results. Now the patient, Merle Ellsworth, had received a prostate-specific antigen test with a result of 26.1. Now anything over 4 is a concern, but it is how the values change over time that is important. Another test was run a few days later. The result was 1.71. Yet another test, and that gave a result of 22.7. And a fourth test gave a result of 0.95. Now, even as a layperson, I can tell you that these results are crazy and probably unsafe to rely on. So there you go. I think a direct link between poor lab consistency and Balwani, who was in charge of it all. On cross-examination, Burns did say to Jeff Coopersmith that a lab co-op, who is a blood testing competitor of Theranos, also makes testing errors, albeit somewhat rarely. He also said that he'd worked with Theranos results for about a year before coming across the single error he testified about. And that was it. If I'm honest, a bit of an anticlimax. No star witnesses like Jim Mattis, no appearance of Tyler Schultz, etc. I guess the prosecution ended on the human impact side of the Theranos debacle. Let me know what you think about that. I think that the prosecution were a bit more clear on their evidence presentation. And you'd expect this having gone through the Holmes trial already. The defence changed a bit as well. They did not linger in the detail in the same way they did in the Holmes trial. Do you remember the Adam Rosendorf lab director cross-examination that went on for days and days and days and didn't happen in this trial, for example? The defence did actually start on Friday afternoon with the calling of a naturopathic doctor. But I'll leave off for here and we'll catch up with that next week. Please like and subscribe and if you do hit that notification bell you won't miss out on the defence in this trial. Bye for now.